What's up YouTube, it's your boy Rep back at it again with another video. Last week, I got my first dislikes on a video, and that hurt. That made me very sad, it made me very upset. But then I went back and I watched the video again, and I realized that it was high tier clickbait garbage. So message received, I will try not to do that again. If you dislike the video for some other reason than it being super clickbaity, or if you just hate me as a person and you need some ammo, I am Jewish talking about money on the internet. If you hate me for some reason, just throw that in the comments. I'd love to hear and talk about it. Anyway, today we're talking about Bitcoin versus MMT, modern monetary theory. I think that this is a very compelling topic. I've looked all over the internet for you know discussions and stuff on this and I haven't found any. So let's talk about it here. We can have a conversation. We can, if you really hate Bitcoin, you can let me know. And if you really think MMT is, you know, has no flaws, I'd love to hear about it. But first, go down below, smash the like button, subscribe. Hit the notification bell only if you really care about this channel. If you don't really care about this channel, don't hit the notification bell. Push notifications are really bad for your brain and I don't want you, I don't want your mental health to suffer through these push notifications if you don't really like the videos. So only hit the notification bell if you really like the videos. Anyway, let's get started. Talk enough about Bitcoin on this channel, so hopefully you know what that is. If not, I will link you to a playlist above, somewhere above, in a card. So enjoy that. Also, in the description, there will be a getting started guide over at ret.blog, www.ret.blog. So we're going to skip over Bitcoin for a minute, and we're going to jump into MMT. What is MMT? Like I said before, MMT stands for Modern Monetary Theory. The first place I was introduced to MMT was in Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth. Link down in the description if you're interested in that book. The big idea that comes out of this book is the difference between a currency user and a currency issuer. So a lot of us think the government shouldn't be running up debts and the government needs to pay its debts because I as a individual currency user, me as a person that you know runs a household, I have to pay my debts. If I just take out a mortgage and never pay it, the bank is gonna come steal my house. So we extrapolate that and we think that the government is the same. If China holds a bunch of US debt, then China can just come knocking at any point and say, hey, give us the money. And that's not really how it works. That's what this book, sort of the central theme of this book is, is that the US government as a currency issuer doesn't have to follow the same rules that you and I do, or even that like the state of Florida, right? The state of Florida is not a currency issuer. The state of Florida doesn't issue Florida bucks yet. The US government, the US federal government as a currency issuer has different rules that it needs to abide by or that it gets to abide by than a regular Joe or a state or even a country like Greece. Greece doesn't have its own currency, it's operating on the euro. So the US government is sort of this unique case where it prints its money and as the currency issuer it has to follow different rules. There are other countries that are like this, Japan, China. So it's not that the US is the only country that's like this, but there aren't very many. And it brings us to this idea of monetary sovereignty. So in the book, Kelton describes monetary sovereignty in this way. Having monetary sovereignty means that a country can prioritize the security and well-being of its people without needing to worry about how to pay for it. And then she goes on to define monetary sovereignty by two points. So the first point is the currency issuer doesn't promise to convert currency into something that it could run out of, like gold. And then number two, the currency issuer doesn't borrow in currencies that are not its own currency. These two points are important because it filters out cases like Greece that we talked about before, where if Greece had, the problem in Greece was that they had a bunch of debt that was denominated in euros. Greece can't just print more euros to get rid of their debt, right? Because they don't have monetary sovereignty. They don't have control over the euro. So the US is never going to end up in a situation like that because all of the U.S.'s debt is denominated in dollars. And at the end of the day, the U.S. could just print a quadrillion dollars and all of the debt would go away, technically. And then the first point is important because if the U.S. was still on the gold standard, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, the U.S. wouldn't just be able to print four quadrillion dollars because they're guaranteeing that a certain amount of their currency can be redeemable for gold, and they don't have four quadrillion dollars of gold. So if we go back to that quote for a second, it ends with, without needing to worry about how to pay for it. Bruh, bruh, bruh. Pretty bold claim, right? Wow, Red, MMT sounds so great. What's the problem? So the very obvious problem is that if we actually printed a quadrillion dollars, I can't even say a quadrillion. It's like a number that 
you don't even, we've, we've started to hear about trillions of dollars of things, but can you imagine a quadrillion? It's almost too many syllables to even think about. If we printed a quadrillion dollars, your $5 foot long at your local sub shop, your favorite local sub shop, would probably not be $5 anymore. It would probably be like $100 or $5,000 or something. And your $20,000 savings, that's your emergency fund that's gonna keep you safe from if you ever get fired and it's gonna allow you to live, that's not gonna be worth $20,000 anymore. That's gonna be worth like $2,000 or $1,000 or $5, right? We don't even, if we print all of this money, what is your money that you're saving even gonna be worth? Even in the book itself, Kelton admits that there is a risk of inflation and that we should be worried about if we print too much money, what is the inflation risk? It's not that they believe that we could print a quadrillion dollars and everything would be fine, they do recognize the risk of hyperinflation. And so that's where MMT sort of bumps up against, you can print money, but you know, don't print too much because you might cause big problems. Like sandwiches, like $5 foot longs costing $5,000. Nobody wants to pay $5,000 for a foot long. Could you imagine the commercial? 5,000, 5,000. $5,000 foot long, it doesn't even, it's not even catchy. You can't even sing a commercial to that. What are people gonna do? The capitalism will completely collapse. So the metaphor that Stephanie Kelton uses in the book is that we are a six foot tall person, like me almost, I'm 5'11 and a half, six foot with shoes. That we're a six foot tall person hunched over because we're worried about bumping our heads on the ceiling, but the ceiling is 10 feet tall. So there's no risk of us bumping our heads in the ceiling. So Stephanie Kelton thinks that we could print money to become 10 feet tall, that there's a huge gap of, of money that we could be printing that we're not printing before we cause inflation. And maybe she knows more about that than I do. I'm not really here to argue about what the number is of the amount of money that we could print. But just to illustrate that she does understand that there is a number that you could hit that if you printed that amount, it would cause a ton of inflation. And then she thinks that the way to come back from all of that money that we've printed is by just raising taxes because taxes take money out of the system and, and give it back to the government where they could theoretically decommission the money, which I think all of this is technically correct. It is just a, a description of how the economy works right now, but I don't think that it really digs into, you know, what are the problems with that? Why should we not be doing this? I don't think it really does anything to answer those questions I think it sort of just presents things how they are and if you want you can't really argue with it because these things are technically correct you could technically print a quadrillion dollars and the debt would go away so a complete agreement with her on on these points but every time we print trillions of dollars or or continue to feed stimulus we're casting a vote to further entrench ourselves in the system it's it's going to be harder and harder and harder for us to ever get out of it and i'm going to show you in a minute why maybe you would want to get out of it or maybe why it's fine maybe this is totally okay and it doesn't matter how much we print we can just continue to do this and as long as we manage the inflation risk correctly that there will be no problems i think these are pretty complex ideas and topics, so I'm not claiming to be 100% correct on this. I'm just giving you my opinion, basically. So where does Bitcoin come into this whole conversation? Before the US just printed as much money as it wanted to, it actually couldn't. We were tied to a gold standard, which is one of those criteria that we talked about before that you can't have if you want to be a monetary sovereign. The gold standard basically meant that every dollar the US prints has to be backed by a certain amount of gold, and that stops them from just printing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. So that's what we had for most of the 1900s. And this meant that the US dollar was not only a medium of exchange, but it was also a store of value. I'm gonna throw up a graph here for a second. So as you can see on the graph, throughout most of the late 1900s, the interest rate on just normal savings accounts was between five and 20%. This is really important because it means that you could just go, if you wanna retire, you could just go to a bank, get a savings account, just a normal savings account, put your money in there, and at the end of your career, you're gonna be able to retire off of the five to 20% interest rate, whatever it was, throughout you know all of your career while you had had that money in the bank. And it's extra low risk because the government will actually insure you know, a part of that money in in case even the bank goes out of business through the FDIC insurance laws. So that was really easy. In the late 1900s, you could just put money into a savings account, sit on it, and now you're gonna be able to retire because the interest rates are so high. Problem is that now, because interest rates are really low, you need to become a asset manager, portfolio expert just to be able to retire. If you leave all your money in a savings account today, it might actually lose value over time 
because of inflation, because the interest rates are so low, it's not going to add any more interest year over year, or it will add very little. And inflation might actually outpace the interest rate that you're getting in your savings account. So what replaced savings accounts was an entire field of portfolio management theory and, and different asset allocations that you could have. So there's an overwhelming, maybe an infinite number of ways that you could allocate assets in a portfolio. And very smart people spend lots of time and lots of money trying to perfect models to come up with what is the perfect asset allocation for you in whatever your goals or situation is, right? My goals are gonna be different than someone who's 65 and about to retire. So very smart people come up with these models, literally trying to predict the future of incredibly complicated systems. What is a more complicated system than the global economy? I can't even like, you know, what even is the global economy, right? Like it's, it's such a large system and you're gonna try to predict it with a model. So obviously none of these models are 100% accurate because the whole picture that they're trying to model is way too complicated. It's almost like these people are sitting at their Bloomberg terminal crystal balls, just look at the crystal ball and then they say, 60, 40 stocks and bonds. And then you just go do that. And it's like, did they just shake a magic eight ball to come up with that answer? And sometimes they're right, but in cases where they can't predict the future, right? They weren't gonna predict 2008 or most of them didn't. They weren't gonna predict the pandemic that we're in right now. There's all sorts of things that these models just are not able to predict. And those things often have disproportionate tail risk associated with them. So because the dollar is no longer a store of value, now to retire, you either need to one, jump head first into this world of asset allocation and portfolio management theory and hope you don't mess it up too bad, or two, hire a hopefully smart person to do that for you. And at the risk of sounding like one of these people with a crystal ball, let me look at my crystal ball real quick. I think the right answer is Bitcoin, or that's what my crystal ball says. In my mind, Bitcoin can be the store of value that the US dollar is is not anymore because of MMT. And, and I think that that's sort of a reality of what we're living in right now with these trillion dollar stimulus plans and these trillion dollar climate plans and stuff like that. I think the big question and the question that you might be asking is, well, why would anyone even use Bitcoin? So this is where I think we can make a distinction between the US dollar and Bitcoin. You know what the monetary policy of Bitcoin will be today, tomorrow, and in a hundred years. You know that it's going to spit out new blocks every day and that every four years, the number of blocks that are coming out is gonna get cut in half. And you can predict with great accuracy the number of Bitcoin that will be out there today, tomorrow, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 20 years from now, and 100 years from now. You can do all of that. And all you have to do is download the software and take a look. What you don't know is how much money the US government is going to print today, tomorrow, or in February. You don't even know who the president will be in February. And you definitely don't know who the president will be four years from now or eight years from now. And you don't know what that person's ideas will be for who should be in charge of printing money, right? What what if they put Stephanie Kelton in the role of Fed chairman? Is she just gonna print money until we hit 10 foot ceiling? You don't know. And that unpredictability is, I think, why people will move from the US dollar, which right now is not a store of value, into Bitcoin, which is a store value because there's a predictable amount. You know how many that there will be at any given time. And you know that there will never be more than 21 million of them. To illustrate this point maybe a little bit better, how would you like to be Germany trading oil with Saudi Arabia? And you have to denominate your trade in US dollars. That sucks for Germany because they don't have any control over the US dollar. Stephanie Kelton could become the Fed chairman and she might print 10 trillion US dollars or Joe Biden might create his climate plan and print 4 trillion US dollars. What does that do to the price of US dollars and what does that do to the price of Germany's oil trade with Saudi Arabia? They don't want that fluctuation and that uncertainty in their markets. They would like to have control over their transactions. It sounds a little bit like taxation without representation. Germany has no representation in US federal monetary policy. And so why should they have to transact? Why should they have to do business deals denominated in the US dollar? And for me, that's sort of where these tenants of MMT sort of fall apart. Everything makes sense if the US dollar is the global reserve currency. But what happens if the US dollar is not the global reserve currency? 
What happens if we print too much? People like Germany get upset. They say, why would I transact in US dollars when I could denominate oil in Bitcoin or I could denominate oil in some other currency? And I think when that system starts to fall apart, that's where MMT, it just doesn't make sense anymore. You actually can't print as much money as you want because these other people that have vested interests in your product, the US dollar staying stable, are not gonna be happy when you print four trillion dollars to address climate issues. So I think that as people sort of wake up to this and as it becomes a bigger and bigger problem, people will start to, and large institutions will start to rush into Bitcoin. And every four years, the incoming supply gets cut in half. And so as more and more money rushes in at the same time as less and less Bitcoin is being produced, that's just gonna, you know, exponential price increase. In my opinion, not financial advice. Don't take anything that I'm saying seriously. I'm just a guy in a room with an Apple poster and a fancy monitor. What do I know? People might be saying, Rhett, Bitcoin is even more volatile than the US dollar. What the f are you talking about? I think for now it is, it's only been around for 10 years, but as larger and larger institutional investors come in, they will necessarily dampen the price volatility. They don't want to run the price up to a million. They want to establish their very large positions in a narrow band of price ranges. and so. So as tons of institutions come in and that money comes in and they want to stay between certain bands of price, that's what they're going to do. And as more and more automated investments come in, price movements and fluctuations in Bitcoin will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it's a very stable asset. In my opinion, this will solve the decades long inflation store of value problem that the US has. We can still transact in dollars and that will all be fine. And I don't think that Bitcoin necessarily is going to ever be better than the US dollar at transacting at, you know, I want to go buy some Starbucks. I don't think it's going to be good for that. The problem that it does solve is if you just put your money into it, it is sound money. And so what people could do in the 1900s, in the late 1900s, where they just are putting money into a savings account and then retiring off of that one simple investment, I think that Bitcoin can become that store of value for people. So then you'll have US dollar or whatever your native currency is for medium of exchange. And then on the other hand, you'll have Bitcoin sound money, fixed supply, store of value. And that's how MMT and Bitcoin are going to live in the same world. So that's it. To summarize, I think MMT is here to stay. We're not getting rid of it. It's too late. We're addicted to stimulus. It's going to keep happening. But I think the best defense against it is Bitcoin because it is the only fixed asset in the known universe. Gold, not fixed. Elon Musk is going to mine those asteroids. And then there's going to be a ton of gold. So Bitcoin is the answer. And I think it's going to protect us against MMT. For a really good introduction to MMT, MMT, we just touched the surface of it today. There are a lot of other things, tenants of MMT, like the federal jobs guarantee that we didn't talk about at all. So if you want more information on that, I highly recommend that you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth. I don't totally agree with everything that she says, but I think it's an excellent book and it absolutely gets the idea across to you. I think once you read that book, you're 100% aware of what MMT is and what MMT people believe. So links for that down below. I actually listened to it on Audible and it was really easy. The narrator was great. It comes with the graphs and the PDFs and everything. So I highly recommend you listen to it there. And if you sign up with the link down below, you can get up to two free books, including you could choose the deficit myth as one of those books. So links for that down below. As you might have gathered from watching this video, these topics are incredibly complicated and these are just my initial thoughts and opinions. Definitely open to changing my opinions, definitely open to conversation. I'd love to learn more about it because I'm really interested in both Bitcoin and MMT. So if you have any disagreements agreements or agreements, throw those in the comments and let's talk about it. Or if there are any specifics that you want to see me dive deeper on, let me know and I'll make another video. All right, that's it. Leave a like if you learned something. Subscribe for more money tech success videos every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. When are they? Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. 10 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Eastern, Monday, your favorite day of the week. All right, I love you all. Goodbye.